281 in your hymnal 281 we have heard the joyful sound Jesus saves Jesus saves let's all stand together as we sing 281 together on that first we have heard the joyful sound singing this morning. Good to see you in church today. Hey, that's good news, isn't it? Jesus saves. And uh, if you don't know that, I hope you'll understand that by the time the service is over this morning. But uh, delighted you're here today. And let's open with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you now this morning. We thank you for another Lord's Day that you brought us to. And Father, we bow here at the beginning of the service. And we do ask you to meet with us this morning. You made the promise that when two or three gather together that uh, there you are in the midst and Lord we uh, desire your presence to be here this morning we need you to meet with us and speak to our hearts we're a needy people and so God I pray that each of us at the best we know how yield ourselves to you and that Lord you'd help us to focus and to concentrate this morning and not miss what you have for us today and so Lord bless the music bless the fellowship together honor the preaching of your word do your will in our lives, please. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Yeah. 
361, 361, walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains, through the deep vale. Heavenly sunlight. <clears throat> Let's sing that first together. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains, through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that. singing this morning now some announcements listen carefully if you would please and um, our regular schedule today 5 30 we have a christian growth class that meets in the conference room downstairs across from the nursery and uh, tonight's lesson is going to be on the battle for your mind the battle for your mind you know your your living never changes until your thinking changes uh, thinking determines living and so it's a battle for your mind. And we'll discuss that this evening at 5.30. Then 6.30, we'll be back here for the evening service right here in the auditorium. And tonight, Lord willing, we'll look at that passage in James, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. And uh, availeth much, the Bible says. So we'll look at that passage this evening. And uh, we hope you'll be back for the evening service. Tomorrow night, ladies' night out, 6.30 p.m. over in the Fellowship Hall. There's a sign-up sheet downstairs. You're uh, getting uh, Subway uh, tomorrow night. You get to choose your own sandwich, all right? Uh, your own, what you want on there and uh, what you want to have. So just check the appropriate boxes right across the list there. And uh, you'll have your sub delivered to you. Uh, tomorrow evening and you'll have a great time at ladies night out that's 6 30 tomorrow night and then uh, we want to uh, want to announce to you the uh, Knickerbockers our missionaries over in Nepal uh, they're in town for a family conference uh, down in Lancaster Ohio uh, at the Lancaster Baptist Church and so we want to let you know about that and um, we you're happy about that aren't you Roy and uh, we can that's your hometown, huh? All right. And uh, they're going to be there tomorrow night. Uh, let's see. Tomorrow night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night at 7 p.m. 
uh, Thursday night they're having a couple's banquet. Uh, that's $15 a person. That's at 6.30 on Thursday night. And if uh, any of you are interested in uh, heading down uh, to see them, see the Knickerbockers at all on Monday night, Tuesday night, or you can see uh, Jan Proke, and uh, I have directions here as well. And uh, you see me or see her, and we'll get you set up for that. Good opportunity for you to see the Knickerbockers and be part of the family conference there at Lancaster Baptist Church in Lancaster. All right? And then... Um, See, I already talked to Chris about meeting me after the service, and then I need to uh, let you know now, we uh, had some work done, been doing, got some men working on our bus, the, the big 72 passenger bus, um, had to replace a starter, and had to replace a couple batteries, and then a fuel filter, and uh, things along those lines, and it started and started running, and they took it out for a test drive, and heard something pop along the way down south of 71 here, a couple exits down, and uh, they've got it uh, in a safe place down there. The fellow has a junkyard there, but they uh, found out it's a, what do they call that part, a turbo charger yeah. that is need to be purchased, and um, we took some, uh, it's, it, it found a, found one that is uh, less than what we talked about on Wednesday. We The, the best we had found was $720, and um, that was rebuilt. 800 brand new, and uh, but we did find one for I think $480. Uh, uh, comes from California. Uh, it'll be here sometime in the middle of the week. We took an offering uh, with that 480 when the starter and the batteries and everything else. We're we're nearing a thousand dollars that we put into the bus, and but that's okay. It's a good bus. Uh, it's it, it, it's been good for us and. We need to get that bus up and running. Uh, the bus route's growing, and uh, brother. Uh, Linky's doing a great job with that, and uh, he's chomping at the bit to go even harder and, and, and longer and get get the thing filled up, but we got to get it uh, ready to roll. We've got some men ready to put the part in. We took an offering Wednesday night for that part, and we got $332 uh, Wednesday evening, and I just thought I'd, I'd put it out this morning. For those of you who weren't here Wednesday night, if you could help with that, it sure would be a blessing, and uh, it's a good investment. Uh, and, the, and the souls and bringing folks to church who ordinarily wouldn't be able to come. And so uh, if you can do that, when we have the offering a little bit, just uh, designate your gift that you'd like to give. Put bus on there, and it'll go towards that bus repair. There's envelopes on the table back there uh, that you can use, and you can just write bus on there and put your offering in there, and that way we'll know that uh, that's what it'll go towards. And uh, we appreciate you uh, doing what. Just ask the Lord if he'd have you help with that, and if he would, uh, we sure would appreciate it. All right. Well, let's take a minute, and we'll welcome our guests that are with us today in the service. Uh, anybody visiting here this morning for the first time? Got some gentlemen right here. I met them outside. And uh, uh, let's see. Kevin, is that right? And Doug? Good. All right. And Kevin's a radio listener. Is that right? Praise the Lord. Good to have you this morning, guys. So is Doug. All right. Great. Good to have you guys here this morning. All right. The usher's going to give you a, a guest a welcome card there. And if you'll take just a moment, fellas, and fill those out for us, I sure would appreciate it. And a little bit, we have the offering, and just put the card in the plate, if you would, and keep the pen as our gift to you for coming today. We're glad you're here this morning. Thank you. All right, let's give these gentlemen a warm welcome, shall we?
Hymnal 246, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground, 246. You can remain seated as we sing. Higher ground. On that first together. I'm pressing on the upward way. Let's turn over to 191, if you would, in your hymnal. 191, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Let's all stand together one more time as we sing. 191, together on that first. Oh, and upon life's billows you are tempest When you are discouraged, sinking all is lost. Count your many blessings, name them one. one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guest. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. On that last together, so amid the conflict, whether great or small. Let's sing that last. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Blessings angels will attend, help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. seated. Have the ushers come and they'll be ready to receive our offering this morning. Be prepared to give as God has blessed you and prospered you. Uh, two weeks from today will be Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and we'll have a special offering on that day for the needs we've been praying for on Wednesdays, prayer and fasting. And I hope you've been praying and fasting. Ask the Lord what he'd have you do on that special offering Sunday. And that'll be April the 5th, all right? And uh, let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our offering this morning. Brother Wallace, lead us in our prayer, please. Father, you're such a great God. And Lord, we need your help in this morning. We are human. We're needy people. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us to pay attention, to apply to our lives as needed. Lord, we need you to uh, set our minds at ease. and Lord, help us to uh, just uh, know that it's words coming from your book. They're true words. They're pure words. And Lord, uh, just uh, be with us now as we open up your book. Lord, bless the offering as only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. your Bible this morning, if you would, please, in Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, please. We're going to read the first chapter, the 11 verses that are here. 
we read them responsively as we normally do. We'll begin together on verse 1, and I'll read 2, and we'll alternate like that until we end together on verse 11 of Nehemiah chapter 1. The preacher always likes to hear the pages of the Bible rustling. I just don't like to hear him rustle too long. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 1. Do you have it? All right, let's stand together and we'll have the reading of the scripture, please. All of us standing to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 1 of Nehemiah chapter 1. Ready? The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him, and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, Though there were of you cast unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the word of God. Father, I would ask you now that you would continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word today we thank you again for the bible and thank you lord for giving your words to us that we hold copies of it in our hand today lord i pray that you would put our heart in tune with your heart that we would have ears to hear what the spirit would say to his church this morning and father i pray you'll bless the special to that end and that each of us would do our very best lord to give you our undivided attention And we'll thank you for that, for we do pray it in our Savior's name. Amen. There came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled their hearts with singing and gave them peace within. The prophet gave his promise, the Spirit would descend, and from your inner being. 
Father, we bow before you in prayer now. We thank you, Lord, for a great salvation that you provided for us through Jesus Christ and his death and burial and resurrection on the cross. And Father, as we open up your word now this morning, I would ask for your help as I bring the message today. I would ask for the help of people as they listen to the message this morning. Lord, I pray that You'll help me to say the things that ought to be said and to leave unsaid things that don't need to be said. But I pray you would help each individual that's listening here this morning to focus and give their attention to the only book you've ever written. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, you would do your work in our midst today and do what only you can do in the hearts and lives of people this morning. Challenge us once again on this important subject of prayer. And I'll thank you in advance, Lord, for what I believe you'll do here in our midst this morning. Thank you for being a God that hears and answers prayer. Amen. The interesting book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the king. They're in captivity. And by the way, there's a lot of uh, impossible situations here, unlikely situations. It's, it, it's highly unlikely, you understand, for an exile like Nehemiah was to be a cupbearer to the king. You understand a cupbearer was somebody who was not only one who kept the king from being poisoned, he would, nothing would be brought to the king to eat or drink, but the cupbearer would take it first. And if it didn't kill him, then it was okay to go to the king. So normally that would not go to an exile. That would not go to, some, would go to someone who would be very trusted by the king. And that usually is not someone you've taken captive. They probably would have ulterior motives. 
But Nehemiah has held this position now. And Nehemiah, you have to understand something. Nehemiah was an ordinary guy. So for him to be in that position of cupbearer, that was an amazing thing to begin with. Then he has a friend. Uh, the, the, a group has already left to go back to Jerusalem from Babylon to rebuild the temple. That was led by Ezra and Zerubbabel. And he inquires how that situation is going. And he doesn't get a good answer. The good answer, it says in verse 3, is they that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. What a great report. Nehemiah is very concerned about that. And uh, by the way, we're talking about 450 years before Christ is born. So you understand where we are in the timetable. And he gets burdened about the condition of Jerusalem and the condition of his home city and which now was in a heap the gates burned with fire, people discouraged, devastated in poverty. Nehemiah begins to weep. Begins to weep, and the Bible says in verse 4, fast and pray over it. One of the major themes you'll see is, if you ever take time to read through the book of Nehemiah, is it is a book of prayer. Now, it's a book of work. You'll find that out later, but you understand there's 12 prayers in the book of Nehemiah. And, and certainly, you can try to work, but if you work before you pray, it's not going to mount anything. George MacDonald said this, And whatever man does without God, he must fail miserably or succeed miserably. Whatever a man does without God, he must fail miserably or succeed more miserably. In other words, any seemingly successful person that does so independent of God is still miserable. It's, it's Tom Brady winning his third Super Bowl and saying, is this all there is? Tom Brady saying, I, I, I've, got, I've reached the pinnacle of my career, I've reached the pinnacle of my profession, and I'm still empty inside. Deion Sanders the same way when he won the MVP of the Super Bowl and had a new Corvette sitting out in his driveway and laying his head at night and realizing I've got the glory and I've got the ring and I've got the MVP and yet I'm empty inside. You can either fail miserably or succeed miserably. Alan Redpath said, There's too much working before men and too little waiting before God. If we took 1% of the energy we put into trying to make things happen and invested that into prayer, we would see an exponential increase in blessings. The book of Nehemiah is about building a work for God, but behind every great work for God, there is a kneeling figure. There is always prayer. And all of heaven's power becomes focused on the work of God when the people of God are willing to weep and to pray and to fast for what is truly important in life. Our priorities get so skewed as to what's important in life. Let me read something to you. It was October 29, 2012. Hurricane Sandy had slammed into the coast of the northeastern United States. The Category 2 storm became the largest Atlantic hurricane on record, with winds spanning 1,100 miles. As Hurricane Sandy bore down in New York City, almost everything shut down except one rogue Starbucks near Times Square. Desperate but highly committed Starbucks junkies fought the high winds, dangerous rain, and dire warnings just to get a latte or a cup of coffee.
Bethany Owings walked 10 blocks with her one-year-old daughter for her specialty coffee. I saw on Facebook they were open, and it was scary, she said, not having Starbucks. Her neighbor and her friend, 29-year-old Chris Hernandez, came along later and said, well, when she said they were open, I was like, pack the baby up, let's go. I didn't know they were all going to close. I started panicking. There is nothing else I would have gone out for. This makes my day complete. Alex Mwangi, 25 years of age, walked more than 20 blocks looking for an open Starbucks. He told reporters, it took half an hour, but I'm a Starbucks fanatic. David Lowe, also 25, said he went to three closed Starbucks before learning the store was open. He said, I'm really happy these guys are open. I can't get a pumpkin spice latte, is that how you say that, anywhere else. So desperate for coffee, they didn't let the biggest hurricane on the eastern coast stopped them from getting it. Now, we, we, can, we smile and we shake our heads in disbelief at some of that, but let me ask you a question. How desperate do you want God in your situation? How desperate are we when we need God to intervene? Nehemiah realized the desperate situation that they were in. And he decided that, that we need to, to pray and we need for God to act. And if I need God to act, listen, I, if I want God to do something unusual, then I have to do something unusual. If I want God to, to, to go above and beyond the ordinary, I have to be willing to go above and beyond the ordinary. Nehemiah hears about this impossible situation. And, and he's, he's discouraged about it, but he's not defeated. And, and, and God's people are never helpless in the face of problems. You don't just have to sit by and idly accept whatever comes your way in life. That's why I don't like the thing, well, you know, whatever happens, it just happens for a purpose. I understand that, that unsaved people say that, but let me help you out with something. Listen, God is in control of our lives. We have to understand that, listen, sometimes God brings adversities into our life. Listen, when, when He sent the disciples off into the storm in the boat, the disciples didn't just sit in the boat and say, well, I guess everything's here for a reason. You know what they did? They called on the Lord. They realized, they, at first, one time, Jesus was sleeping in the boat. Another occasion, He was up on the mountain praying, and He came walking to them on the water. But in every case, he was testing them in that circumstance to see whether they would try to handle it themselves or whether they would call out to him. And God is going to bring you and he's going to bring me into situations in life to test us to see how are you going to handle this. Are you going to do it yourself? Are you going to figure out what you can do? Are you going to try to say, well, it all just happens for a reason? Are you going to call out to me and ask me to help you? See, every miracle God ever performed started out, with, started out as a problem. We want the miracles, we don't want the problems. In fact, uh, you know, for God, for God to do the impossible, you have to start out with something that's impossible. And we don't like that. We like seeing God do the impossible, but that means we have to be in a situation where we think it's impossible. We don't like that end of it. We like the other end, though. So Nehemiah, I think his initial reaction was weeping and, and dejection and discouragement. That's not the report he expected to hear. And I think it was disheartening for him. That's his human reaction. But, but be, he didn't stay there. He, he, his, his spiritual reaction kicked in. And he says, wait a minute, I don't just sit and weep and cry over this and mourn over this. I could pray about this. I can seek God about this. And by the way, Christian, that's for every single believer. Everybody gets news that's discouraging. Everybody has circumstances we, we get and we say, man, I don't like this. 
And you either bow your head and you weep and you cry and you have a pity party, or you say, wait a minute, I can take this to God. I can pray about this, and I can take it to the Lord. And so his counteraction was, that, was to begin to go to God. And by the way, don't, don't look at prayer as, well, the least I can do is pray. The least you can do. Man, that is a powerful tool in the toolbox of the Christian. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And one of those weapons of warfare is prayer. That's why it's so difficult to get us to pray. That's why Satan fights so hard when it comes to prayer. So prayer, we see Nehemiah go to prayer here in Nehemiah chapter 1, and I just want us to look briefly at his prayer this morning, all right? Notice this prayer that he gives to, to the Lord is a prayer of contrition. It's a prayer of contrition. Contrition means repentance. It means a grief of heart over offending God. He understands that he's kneeling before the God of heaven. Look at verse 5. He said, I said, I beseech thee, I beg thee, O God, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants. So he's asking God to, to hear his prayer. Notice, he isn't coming to God flippantly. Prayer is a conversation with God, but I, I mentioned it briefly in Sunday school, but let's always remember who we're speaking to. Let's have a reverence for God, a reverence for who he is. Jesus taught us in the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. He said, And after this manner pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy be thy name. Don't, don't rush into the presence of God asking for your problem to be fixed. In fact, he calls him here the great and terrible God. Terrible here literally means one who incites terror. That's usually not one of the characteristics you hear when people talk about God. You want to say that God is the heavenly grandfather with a long beard and he just wants everybody to be happy. My friend, God is also a terrible God. It's one of his characteristics and it's all about who he is and his position over us. We've, we've, we've lost that in our society. You know, uh, some of you in education, I know Kylie and Rick back there, you know, and my wife has been subbing with sixth graders. And she is, a, she is amazed at how the, the, the sixth graders, she says they, they really believe that they're on the same level as the adults. Do you, do you find that true? I mean, they just, no, no respect for who's, I, when, and, and again, I, I realize that, you know, it's been a few years since I was in sixth grade, but spent the best three years of my life there. And um, the, I'm teasing, it was four. But uh, you, I, I never would have thought to talk back to a teacher. If the teacher said, you need to move over here, you got up and moved over there. You didn't say, well, I got to move. I'm not doing anything wrong. I didn't say you're doing something wrong. I just said you had to move. But they want to. They want to have an argument. They want to have a discussion with you about it. And there's no discussion. So we 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 were losing that in our society. If we're not careful, we come to God that way, and we think we're on the same level as God. We just tell God what want. God's a terrible God. It's the same root word that that the word reverend, where it says holy and reverend is His name. So really, when, when you call, if you call me Reverend Slaybaugh, and I don't like that term, you're really saying I'm terrible Slaybaugh, by the way. Some of you feel that way after listening to me preach, but terrible. But you know, we live in a culture today where all we want to hear about is the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, and the goodness of God, and that's real. Uh, no, no doubt about it. Those are, those are absolutely true. 
But I got news for you as well. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.11, we read it in our Sunday school class this morning, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And that terror has to do with verse 10, where it says we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in our body, whether they be good or bad. And knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Paul says, man, it's going to be a terrifying thing. And knowing that God is terrible, knowing that God is great, knowing that God is the judge, I'm going to persuade men to live for God. We live in a no-fear generation. America's lost her fear for God, who gave us the land. And unfortunately, I believe the church is getting forgetful as well. We used to fear God. And by the way, it showed in our behavior and our lifestyle. I'm not talking about an unhealthy quaking or fear of a dictator at all. But you know, I, I've used this illustration before. When I was a younger child and growing up, you know, what I would fear is when dad would come home and I'd done something wrong. Because I feared that he would take this off from around his waist and he applied it to where God gave me padding. And by the way, that's okay. I, you know what? I survived, and I'm better for it. And nothing wrong with giving a child the spanking the way God intended for it to be given. Walking up and whacking your child is not the proper way to give a spanking. Understand that. But I feared punishment. So I did what was right because I feared being punished by Dad. But as I grew older and I got bigger, when I got to be in high school, I was a little bit taller than my father. You know how it is, as you get older, you shrink. Well, your height shrinks. The rest of you goes the other direction, usually. But, but you get tall enough, and you know what? I, I physically was not afraid of my dad. But I still had a fear of my dad. But the fear had transferred to this. I had the fear of disappointing him. I had the fear of letting him down. One of the worst things that, that could ever happen to me is when my dad looked at me when I had done something wrong my junior year of high school and he looked at me and he just shook his head and he said, I'm so disappointed in you. Man, that, that stuck like a knife in me the last thing I wanted was my dad to say he's disappointed in me. You see, that's, that's the fear that you want to have for God. I don't want to, I don't want to disappoint God. I don't want to, want to have him look down and say I'm, I'm disappointed in you. And, and I'm against, by the way, I, I, just so you know, I'm against much of the preaching and the programs and churches today that tries to pull God down to man's level. I think the church is saying when, when we have that kind of a message, we're kind of just saying to everybody, uh, you're not willing to come on Jesus' terms. You're not willing to come the way Jesus said you should come. And so we'll just make it more tolerable for you. We'll make it a little easier for you. And, and we'll, we'll uh, dumb down the version, so to speak, so that you can come to God the way you want. God isn't just the man upstairs, my friend. He's a holy God. So we learn from Nehemiah how you come to God in contrition. You come to God humbly. God gives grace to the humble. And so we come to God understanding who He is. When I, listen, when I have a big problem, when I have difficult situations, when I have impossible situations, I'm not looking for a God I can high-five. I'm looking for an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-holy God who can do something about the situation I'm in. 
And when you come into his presence, it just causes you to bow or to kneel or to get on your face before him because you realize who you're speaking with. So it's a prayer of contrition, and I think Nehemiah shows us that. But then I want you to see it's also a prayer of concern, a prayer of concern. Uh, Nehemiah didn't just pray because it was time to pray. It wasn't just taking up, he didn't go open up a, a, a book of prayers and pull a couple out that he could recite. It wasn't that kind of praying by road or by tradition. He was praying a real prayer of concern. Somebody said there's two times to pray, when you feel like it and when you don't. But you always should pray. And you especially need to pray when you feel like it the least. Same way with Bible reading, and we've heard that in the RU. Brother Currington always says you'll never read your Bible every day until you read your Bible on the days that you don't want to read your Bible. And that's true. And, and, and so you want to read your Bible. There's two times to read your Bible. What, on the days you want to read it and the days you don't want to read it? Same way with prayer. The promise to Joshua... 1 and verse 8 that God gave to him as he took over from Moses and is going to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. He said, Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. His success was all tied in to the Word of God and meditating on the Word of God. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you prayed, not because you were called upon or, be, or out of habit, but because you were broken hearted and hurting? When's the last time you just were burdened about something so much, you just had to get away from everybody and everything and go pray? When's the last time you bore the burden of another Christian and took their request so much to your heart that you carried it to God in prayer and tried to beseech God on their behalf? A heartfelt concern. Someone said, we pray without crying. We give without sacrificing. We live without fasting. Is it any wonder we sow without reaping? We're a dry-eyed church in a hell-bent world. Our eyes are dry, our faith is old, our heart is hard, and our prayers are cold. Nehemiah would have never got the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt had he not wept and showed concern. That burden led to the prayer that led to the miracle. You know, tears are a language God understands. He understands. He's, he's moved by what we're moved by. We have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's touched with what we're touched with. They that sow in tears shall... Reap in joy, the Bible says. So it's concern, a heartfelt concern, a genuine concern that drove him to prayer. Let me give you the third thing about Nehemiah's prayer. It was contrition, it was concern, but it was also a prayer confession. A prayer confession. Verse 6, Let thine ears now be attentive, and thy eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night, for the children of Israel thy servant, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. He's confessing sin. Why do you confess sin when you pray? Because if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord does not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. 
Nehemiah knew it was sin that led to the destruction of Jerusalem, why the walls were down and the city had been destroyed. And it doesn't do any good to weep over the condition and weep over the, the destruction if you're not willing to confess the sin that led to the destruction. If your life is lying in ruins this morning, you have to ask yourself, is sin to blame? Don't just cry over your situation. Make it right. You say, I'll never get back what I had before. Oh, my friend, you may get back more than what you ever had before. Somebody says, I've blown it. I've lost so much. It can never be regained. No, 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 no. We serve a great God. And, and we serve a God. Listen, if you're still breathing, He's not finished with you yet. Don't write yourself off. Don't give up. Don't throw your hands up. No, 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 no. You're still here. You're still breathing. God still has something in mind for you. Amen. Now, there's a difference between being sorry for sin and just being sorry you were caught in your sin. Some people weep only because they're experiencing the painful consequences of sin. There's a difference between weeping because you don't like your consequences and weeping because you have let down the God of heaven. You've let down your heavenly Father. You've disappointed Him who loved you and gave Himself for you. Nehemiah didn't just weep over the consequences. He wept over the sin that led to those consequences. Tell folks on our Friday night addiction program, don't just, listen, don't just be concerned about uh, not, you know, having God change your addiction and not do your addiction. Be willing to change the behavior that leads to the addiction. A lot of times they, they just, well, I haven't done, I haven't smoked or I haven't had a drink or I haven't done any pills or I haven't done this for so long. Yeah, but you know what? You know why? You will because you haven't, you're not changing your behavior that led to that. Just want to let God change your behavior, which is changing your thinking, which will lead to you changing your living. Nehemiah confesses those sins. And he uses we and I and my when he prays, if you look at verses 6 and 7. And some of the sins that he's talking about, he wasn't alive for. And certainly he wasn't a part of. They're happening a thousand miles away from him. But he, but he takes it and identifies with the sins of his people. Ezra 9 and verses 5 and 6. The Bible says this, At the evening sacrifice I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord, and said, O oh my God, I'm ashamed, and blush to lift up my face to thee. My God, for our iniquities are increased over the head, and our trespasses grown up to the heavens. Here's uh, the, the prayer in the book of Ezra, and he says, man, I, I, I'm blushing, I'm embarrassed with the things we've done. And I would say to you this morning, America has lost her ability to blush anymore. We speak of things that ought not to be spoken of. We do things that ought not to be done. We've lost that ability to blush. Nehemiah recognized the fact that when a nation turns against God, there's a sense, listen, there's a sense in which all of us bear responsibility. America is where she is today, and that, that responsibility lies at the doorstep of our churches. We have not been what we ought to have been. And it doesn't matter to me that I, I understand the proliferation of what they what they call mega churches and uh, there 25 years ago there was only a handful of them uh, you could uh, under a hundred of them in the United States now there's uh, almost 2500 of churches that run 2,000 or more and if, if that's the case listen and if that's if that's the kind listen what what is that producing? Is it producing godliness in our country? Are we seeing an impact on our country of folks coming back to God? 
I'm afraid we're not. Well, that's, that, that lays on us, not as we're inside the building, but as we walk out of the building. It's where we live and where we work and where we go to school and the people we interact with in our world that we're having the impact for Christ that we should. Most of you are familiar with Minister Joe Wright who opened a session of the Kansas legislature in 1996. And I realized that, and I'll be open in prayer in May sometime in uh, the Ohio legislature, but, you know, and, and, and I'm sure that every, every week there's somebody in there praying and they kind of get used to <laughs> all the, 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 kind of the same thing is prayed all the time, I'm pretty sure. Well, here's what Joe Wright prayed that day in 1996. He said, Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, Woe to those who call evil good, but that's exactly what we've done. We've lost our spiritual equilibrium and inverted our values. We confess that. We've ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it an alternative lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have neglected the needy and called it its self-preservation. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O God, and know our hearts today Try us and see if there be some wicked way in us. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Guide and bless these men and women who have been sent here by the people of this state and who have been ordained by you to govern the great state of Kansas. Grant them your wisdom to rule and make their decisions. Direct us to the center of your will. I ask in the name of your Son, the living Savior, Jesus Christ. The response was immediate. A number of legislators walked out during the prayer in protest. But in six short weeks, his church logged more than 5,000 phone calls with only 47 responding negatively. You see, we need a national confession like that. I long, I long for America to have leaders again. I long for America to have a leader who will stand up and, and be somebody who would uh, run for the highest office in our land who would say, this is what's right, this is what's wrong, you like it, you lump it, that's the way it is. Quit trying to worry about offending somebody or being politically correct and just tell the truth as it is. But we need a national confession and a personal confession. You know, it is a whole lot easier to see sins in someone else's life than it is to see them in my own. It's so easy to see somebody else's faults and so difficult to see our own. That, that, that so simple, Jesus said to see the speck in someone else's eye and we miss the beam that's coming out of ours. have to be willing to have personal confession of sin. Do you have something big to pray about? You need God to move in a big way. By the way, big, big job. By the way, a great testimony. When Nehemiah in chapter 2, when he goes before the king, the king makes a statement. He says, what's the matter with you? He said, I've never seen you sad in my presence. How'd you like to have that testimony? Could your employer who you work for, could your supervisor who sees you every day, or your foreman who sees you every day, or your office manager, whatever the case may be, could would they be able to come to you if you were had a sad countenance and say, Man, what's wrong with you? I've never seen you sad. 
Wow. And Nehemiah shared with the king what was going on and, 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 and prayed again and asked God to help him and asked for permission to go back and rebuild those walls. And he took a contingent back. And you, you read the book, it's an amazing story. And they, they rebuilt those walls around, around Jerusalem in 52 days. I mean, not, not just clearing away the rubble and getting rid of all the stuff, but building brand new walls. That was amazing, amazing accomplishment with the opposition they faced. Never would have happened if they hadn't prayed. If they hadn't prayed. What do you need? What's your big thing that you need from God? Jesus said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God... All things are possible. 52 days, but 11 more prayers after this one in chapter 1. We think we have too much to do. There's not time to pray. God says there's so much to do, you can't help but pray. And God will do the rest. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, that's your biggest need. And God has provided for that need in Jesus Christ. The only way you get to heaven is by faith in Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, receive Him today. Those of you who are saved and you have some big requests, you have some situations, say, man, that's impossible. We have a God who specializes in doing the impossible. You just have to come to Him in prayer and ask for His help. And He can do big things in each one of our lives. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention today. Thank you, Lord, for including the prayer of Nehemiah in the Word of God. It's helped us today. It's challenged us today. And Lord, we look even at our country and it seems like an impossible task to see your turn and come back to God. But you're the God of the impossible. And Lord, we, we may not be able to change the whole country, but Lord, would you help us to change our world in which we live in? the offices where we go to work and the stores where we shop and the neighborhoods we live in and the world in which we move and live. Help us to be the influence we ought to be. And help us to realize, Lord, that won't happen unless we pray. And so I pray that we would take time to pray and to keep praying and to get your help. That we would be concerned over the condition not only of our country, but our own lives. I pray that we would be known as a people of prayer. And we would see you great, see you do great and mighty things that we know not. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many folks in the room this morning would say, Pastor, I, I know that I'm saved. I know that there's a time in my life when I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I'm confident that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Pastor, here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I'm not sure. I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I'd like to be sure. I'd like to know. And Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me. Would you let me pray for you? Would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'll pray for you this morning. Okay. wonder how many folks in the room this morning would say, Preacher, God dealt with my heart about Nehemiah and his example in prayer. I've got some big things I'm facing. I've got some big issues. God dealt with my heart today that it's not me making it happen it's me going to him in prayer and he'll make it happen I wonder how many believers here this morning say preacher God challenged my heart today please pray for me this morning will you slip your hand up God bless you 
Amen. 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 God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray, and we'll have our invitation. God has dealt with your heart this morning. Come bow the knee to him. Humble yourself before God. Begin that process of seeking Him. Good news for you. Nehemiah prayed four months before he ever left to go back to do something about the walls of Jerusalem. It seems faster as you read the Bible there. But you look at the dates, four months went by. You, you prayed a week and you're ready to give up. Weren't you? He prayed four months before God opened the door for him to be able to go. Will you keep praying? Will you keep seeking His face? Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to hearts this morning. Lord, I, I, I pray that You help each one, Lord, do what You're bidding them to do in their heart today. And I pray, Lord, that no one would resist You or hold back on You today. Those in the room, if there's anyone, Lord, I didn't see any hands went up. If anyone is never received Christ as their Savior, that they would come and receive Him today. If they're saved and they've never been scripturally baptized, I pray they'd come and say, I need to be baptized. Lord, maybe there's somebody here today and they're saved and they're baptized and they believe this is where they ought to belong and serve the Lord. I pray they'd come. And your people, Lord, who you've spoken to just need to come and kneel and pray. I pray they'd come and speak with you this morning. May you have your will and way in these next few moments of invitation. And I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart this morning. Respond to him today, will you please? Oh, soul, right. are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior And life more abundant and free Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace Father I pray that we would keep our eyes turned upon you you would help us when difficult situations arise and troubling times come. 
that Lord while we have the human reaction we then would have the counter reaction and we'd realize we have a great weapon called prayer and prayer can move the arm that moves the world forgive us for our lack of prayer and help us as passionate as those people were for their coffee may we have a passion for our God to want to know you and be with you and pray to you and see you do great and mighty things that we know not. We need you. As the choir sang today, show us how much we need you. We love you, Lord, and I pray, God, that you give us a good afternoon and you would prepare our hearts for what you have for us in store this evening in the service. Dismiss us now with your care. Lord, help us to go out of this place, Lord, and influence the world in which we live. Help us to be the salt and light that you've called us to be. But Lord, help us to be much in private with God that you could bless us publicly before men. We love you, Lord. Thank you for a wonderful morning this morning with the people of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.